Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Felder. Okay, I always have to look for that red light, you know. <laughs> Good to see everybody back, and for those of you again on television, we just again want to thank you, and uh, we appreciate your letters, your financial help, and most of all, that you're praying for us, because uh, after all, if it's not done prayerfully, we uh, labor for nothing. And the same for those of you here in the studio audience. We want you to know that we appreciate your effort to come in and be a part of this. And uh, all of us labor together. I, uh, I usually write a note to folks and say that that's what we are. We're co-laborers. And uh, what I receive as reward someday, you're going to be a part of it. Okay, now we get... We sort of ran out of time in that last program, and I didn't realize I was down to seconds. I thought I had a couple minutes. But yeah, let's go back so we wind that up. I kind of left everybody hanging on a string. Go back to John's Gospel, chapter 14. And uh, I just want to show again the, the stark difference. Because Jesus meant what he said. He wasn't lying. He wasn't stretching the truth. It was absolute what he said but it doesn't work today. All right, here it is, John 14, verse 13 again, picking right up where we left off in our last program. Whatsoever, that means what it says, whatsoever you shall ask in my name that I might do, no, I will do. That's a promise. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. And he repeats it, if you shall ask anything, in my name I will do it. Now, you and I know that that doesn't work. You cannot tell me that everything you've ever asked for, God has done it. Because it just doesn't happen in this age of grace. But with their view of the kingdom, and with Christ as the king, yes, then it would become a reality. But now come back with me to the language of the age of grace, the church age of the Apostle Paul, Philippians. Now, whenever folks call us and have a real prayer need, this is what all of us there at, at the ranch, myself and the girls working out in the office, and Iris, we always take them right back to this portion of Scripture. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Because this covers all the bases. Now, there are other portions where Paul certainly prays as a model prayer for us, but this just says it all. Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Be careful or worry about nothing. That's easier said than done too, isn't it? Be careful for nothing. But in everything. Now there again means what it says. Everything. Now, I think all of us are sensible enough that we're not going to ask for something silly or something that's inappropriate. But being commonsensical about it, as believers, we now have the freedom to come into the throne room and ask for anything, all right? So, worry about nothing but in everything. Now, I know there are those who hold that God is not concerned about our physical or material needs. And I say, hogwash. He's concerned about the whole being. He's just as concerned about yours and my physical well-being, our material well-being, as the spiritual. They are all part and parcel of our whole makeup. In fact, Paul says in 2 Corinthians, Thessalonians, I think, chapter 5. May your whole, W-H-O-L-E, may your whole body, soul, and spirit, see, be part and parcel of God's blessings. Well, that covers all of it. All right, so here we go again. First Corinthians, uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, which means asking, but here's the secret. With what? With thanksgiving. 
You see, I think this is where a lot of Christian folks are missing the blessings. They are not thankful. They almost get to the place where they think they deserve it. I don't care where we are in our spiritual experience, we never stop thanking God for everything. Starting with our salvation, our Christian experience, our health, our physical, our material, we thank Him for everything, constantly. For every breath of air, for every bite of food, for every comfort, and for us in America, for every what? Luxury. My, I've said it before, do you realize that much of what we take for granted in America is luxury to a good portion of the world? And I'm thinking primarily of hot water at the tap. What a luxury that we can just turn the tap and have hot water. My, we learned it down in Haiti. I don't think in all the 10 days we were there, we had hot water at all. The more you come home, you begin to appreciate it. But those are just things that are all part and parcel of God's blessings for which we are thankful. All right, move on. You let your supplications, your requests with thanksgiving, known unto God. In other words, you pray. You verbalize it. Now, God may say, yes. We may have almost an immediate answer. He may, in so many words, say, not now, but later. Or he may say a flat what? No, it's not for you. But regardless, and this is what I love, regardless of how you get the answer in verse 6, it's all answered in verse 7. And what does it say? And the peace of God. Now, I always make the, the differential again. Back in... Uh, Back in uh, Romans 5, 1, we have the peace with God, which was our salvation experience, see? Now, the peace with God that comes by faith. In other words, we're no longer an enemy. We're now at peace with God. But this is not peace with God. This is the peace of God. Now, let's, let's just sort of analyze this a minute. Can someone who is not at peace with God ever enjoy the peace of God? No. No, because we're outside of that realm. But as soon as we've made peace with God, we're no longer his enemy. We are now his child. Now we can cash in on the peace of God. Big difference. All right. So the peace of God, which is a result of our relationship with Jesus Christ as a born from above child of God, the peace of God, which passeth all understanding. In other words, we can't comprehend it. We take it by faith. And as I've said so often, even the work of the cross we can't comprehend all that God did at the cross. What little we comprehend is by faith, and someday in glory, yes, we'll probably have a full understanding. But here again, this peace of God as a result of our leaving it with Him passeth all understanding. And whether He answers yes, no, later, or however, this peace shall keep your heart and mind through Jesus Christ. What a promise. Now, I don't have to go back to John and say, well, now, God, you promise that whatever I ask, you'll do it. That's absurd. He doesn't have to do whatever I ask today. But whatever I ask, he has promised that no matter how he deals with it, he will give the peace that passeth all understanding. Now, we've been through some economic turmoil, and a lot of people have lost their source of income, and they've gotten in dire straits. Well, I've been there, I've done that, so I can identify with those kind of people. But you know what? The peace of God keeps us through all that. And if there's someone out there and you're in financial straits, don't despair. God is still on the throne. God is still under control. God will somehow or other bring you through it, and you'll be the better for it. 
I don't care what you're going through. When you look back, you're going to see that it has strengthened you. And we're going to be looking at the same thing in 1 John now a little bit with regard to sickness and death. But never forget that as a believer today, we have access to the throne room. We have that access to share our needs with the Almighty. And regardless of how He answers, we have the answer, the peace that passeth all understanding. All right, great big difference, big difference. All right, now back to 1 John. I think maybe we can finish the, the little book this afternoon. <clears throat> 1 John chapter 5, now verse 16, difficult verse. My, I've, I've been wrestling with this one for the last couple of weeks. If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not, unto death. Now again, I have to even force myself to bring my thinking into line with the Jewish economy. These are Jews that John is dealing with, and they're still part and parcel of the legal system of the Mosaic Law. The temple is still operating. And so we have to take all that into perspective. So if a Jew here in, in John's period of time was to see a fellow Jew delving into some kind of sin that was not gross enough to bring in God's judgmental taking of his life, he was to admonish this brother to depart from sin, whatever it was, lest that become a sin unto death. So it was a matter of taking concern for a fellow believer in the realm of the Jewish economy. All right, then the next statement is, there is a sin unto death. In other words, even in the Jewish economy, if a Jew would not refrain from living a life of sin and would not come back into fellowship, God would take his physical life. Now, we don't see that expressed as much in, in the uh, Jewish scriptures as we do in the Apostle Paul. All right, let's go back and see how Paul dealt with it. Come back with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Now, whenever I deal with this, the first thing I'm going to emphasize to all of you here in the studio, as well as to everyone out in television, be careful. You have to be so careful that you don't get the impression that any time someone gets sick or has dire consequences, that it's because they're in sin. My goodness, God can bring bad health. God can bring financial disaster for the sole purpose of strengthening our faith. Not because he's punishing us, but only to strengthen our faith. Because I'll tell you what, Nothing will increase your faith more than going through dire circumstances and knowing that God never forsook you. So be careful that you don't say that when someone is suddenly stricken with cancer or they've been stricken with something else, oh, they must have sin in their life. Don't ever do that. But it is possible. And the person who's guilty knows that he's guilty of it. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Drop down to verse 28, 29, and 30. Now, of course, these are the verses dealing with the Lord's table, but it's going on beyond the behavior at the communion table. It goes right out into the everyday experiences now. Verse 28 of 1 Corinthians 11. Let a man examine himself, in other words, some introspection, let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh condemnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. In other words, he's careless about what the blood or the, the cup and the bread for the broken body are signifying. All right, now then verse 30. 
For this cause, because someone is careless, for this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many have died. That's what the word sleep implies. But now again, you have to remember that the Corinthian church was a congregation of carnal believers. They had a lot of sin in the congregation, and yet they were believers. All right, now let's go back up to chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. <clears throat> and this is certainly a, a rather gross situation. I'm going to be careful of the language that I use because I know I've got a lot of young kids watching the program, and I don't want to do anything that will embarrass parents. But here we have a case of gross immorality. Such immorality, as Paul says, that even the Romans, the Gentiles, did not practice. All right, now verse 2, the congregation was puffed up. And instead of being mournful over this hideous sin in their group, they had evidently been making light of it. All right, so rather than mourn, he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. See what Paul is saying? That if this individual did not come back from that sinful lifestyle, God would take him. And he would still be saved. Oh, I know this is hard for some people to swallow. But he wouldn't lose his salvation, but God would take his physical life. All right, read on. Verse 3, For I verily, as absent in body and present in spirit, have judged already, as though I were present, concerning him who hath so done this deed. Now, verse 4, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, in the realm of the spiritual congregation there at Corinth. When you are gathered together, and my spirit, in other words, Paul, even though not present, would be present with them, probably prayerfully, that they would be able to handle this. And with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such a one who is practicing this sin, not just falling once, he was living in it. All right? To deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, his physical life. Much like God with Job told Satan he could touch his flesh, but he couldn't take his life. All right? So deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit, the soul, may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. See how plain that is? This man was not going to lose his salvation, but they were going to deal drastically with him if he didn't repent or come back out of that sinful lifestyle. All right, now then. He comes down to verse 10, 11. Verse 9. Verse 9. Having consort with a believer who is in gross sin, that was one thing. And that had to be dealt with. And if that individual would not respond, then he was under danger of having his life taken, as we saw back in 1 Corinthians 11. But now, in order to qualify where we are in this world of rank immorality and wickedness all around us, here's how we have to face it. Verse 9, he says, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company or have fellowship with immoral people, yet not altogether with the immoral of this world or with the covetous, the extortioners, and the idolaters, because if you're not going to rub elbows with any of those people in the five days of the workaday world, you'd have to leave the world because you cannot avoid it. You're going to find yourself in the workplace up against rubbing elbows with these kind of people. That's the world we live in, even then already. But, he says in verse 11, I have written unto you not to keep company, if any man that is called a brother be immoral, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such a one not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not you judge or deal with those that are with 
in. Now look at verse 13. But those who are without, the unbeliever, God's going to take care of them. But the believer, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. And then God will deal with them as according to 1 Corinthians 11. And consequently, amongst the Corinthians who had, like I said, a lot of problems, many of them had already died as a result of their sinful lifestyle as believers. And that's why it behooves us to be careful how we live, because God is not going to permit a believer to bring reproach to his name. And if he will not turn from it, then we know from Scripture God will take him. But now, like I said earlier, and I'm going to repeat, don't ever, don't ever look at someone who's going through tough times, whether it's health or anything else, and say, well, they must be living in sin. No, because usually it's to increase our faith. Okay, now let's go back to 1 John again for a moment. Verse 18. Oh, this is a curve, verse that's thrown a lot of curves at people. Verse 18. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. Have you known people who claim to be believers and that they're so holy that they don't sin anymore? Sure you have. I have. Ridiculous. There's no such thing as living in the flesh and being totally above sin. We're still in the flesh. We still are bombarded with the things of this world. But what part of us as believers cannot sin? The new man. The new man cannot sin. It's divine. It's from God himself. But we've got to remember now Galatians. Come back with me to Galatians. Because again, a lot of Christendom does not teach this. But it's appalling doctrine. That when we become a born from above individual, we are now a two-natured person. We have the new divine nature as a result of God saving us, but we're still kept with that old Adamic nature. Oh, it's defeated. We can render it powerless, but it's still there. And here's where we deal with it the most clearly in Scripture. Galatians chapter 5. Let's start at verse 16, honey. Galatians 5, verse 16. Now, this is Paul writing to Gentiles up there in what's today central Turkey. And they, too, were being deluged with the idea of keeping the Mosaic law along with Paul's gospel of grace. And so this is why the little book of Galatians is written, that you're not under the law. You don't have to keep the Ten Commandments hanging over you. But instead, we have that empowering of the Holy Spirit within and the Holy Spirit does what the law could never do. Okay, here we go. Verse 16. This I say then. Walk in the Spirit. That is, under His control. And you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The Spirit will never direct the believer into a lustful experience. That's not the Spirit's domain. Now here's the reason, verse 17. For the flesh, the old nature, the one that we crucified with Christ at the time of our salvation, the old nature, the flesh, lusteth. Or oh, in another portion, the word is warreth. The old nature warreth against the spirit. The spirit warreth against the flesh. And these are contrary. Now, you can't make it any plainer than that. Those two natures are in us side by side, and they are so totally opposite that they're in a constant warfare. All right? And these are contrary one to the other, so that you cannot 
do the things that you would. Now, you've heard me use the illustration on this program more than once. If you're paddling a canoe upriver, and you pull the canoe out of the water and lay it in the canoe, which way are you going to go? Right back downstream. A canoe is something that you have to constantly keep battling the forces of stream. All right, the Christian life's the same way. The minute we let down our guard, the minute we go several days without prayer and Bible study, we're going to see ourselves spinning around and going backwards. It's a constant warfare. And this is what Paul teaches, see? But now verse 18, if we're led of the Spirit, we keep that paddle in the water. And we're led of the Spirit, then you're not under the law, which means that we're under a whole new set of circumstances. The Spirit has taken the place of the law, and I'm going to show this in just a minute. And then he goes on and shows the two different lifestyles of those natures. The old sin nature are listed right up there in verse 19, 20, 21. And then the new nature is listed in 22 and 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, and faith. See? Totally different makeup than the flesh. All right, now, in one minute, run back to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. And this is why the believer is under totally different circumstances than the Jewish believer under nothing more than the Mosaic system. All right, you got Romans chapter 7, verse 5 and 6. <coughs> Romans 7, 5 and 6. For when we were in the flesh, see, before we experienced this, the saving power and the Holy Spirit coming within, when we were in the flesh, the motions or the acts of sins which were by the law, in other words, coveting and stealing and so forth, they worked in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But, the flip side, but now, since we're saved, we are delivered from the law, that being dead, we're in hell, that we should serve in newness of spirit. See the difference? Now we're going to live under the leading of the Holy Spirit and not under the demands of the letter or the Mosaic law. What a difference. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated.